Darkcast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors and... Reverie True Crime listeners. Welcome to our Sinister Series for the month of October. We're your hosts, CJ... And Paige. Join us as we tell you stories of where something evil lurks in the spirit of Halloween slash spooky season. In our final episode installment of Sinister Series, Something Evil is Lurking, we will present two cases that the crimes occurred on Halloween. Macon, Georgia, in 1985, then-police chief Jim Brooks was speaking to the Telegraph newspaper about the arrests of drag queens, saying, quote, There is a concern that these people could be involved in homosexual activities or criminal activities. It is in the best interest of the community to control people from masking their identity, period. End quote. Macon has a dark past of LGBTQ plus people being the target of hate crimes, according to many sources, one being a Telegraph news article. Take, for example, in 2019, Molly Stevens, a singer who was also on the TV show The Voice back in 2018 and married Ashley Stevens Lawson the same year, is from Macon. Even when she went back to her hometown to attend a church service, she was blown away by what she heard. As we know, not all churches are like this, but some still are. The preacher began asking everyone in the congregation questions. They were to answer saying moral or immoral. Well, the next day, Molly took to social media, stating, quote, when he said sex between someone of the same sex and had the congregation repeat immoral, I quietly walked out and left. I don't know about anyone else's, but my God was holding me tight when I exchanged vows with my wife six months ago. My God has held me tight my entire life, and I've felt it. I've never questioned if God loves me. I hurt for the teenage kid yesterday, sitting in that pew, knowing they are gay, and hearing directly from the leader of the church that they are not on the right path and are placed into a category of being, quote, sexually immoral. I was that kid once. Thank God I found the truth and the courage to not believe that stuff, end quote. There's a ton of information that dates back further than the 1900s about people getting arrested for things like sodomy, solicitation of sodomy, or, quote, wearing a mask, which meant a male was wearing female clothes or a female was in male clothes. I live in Mississippi, and the things that have happened throughout history to the LGBTQ plus community and even still today, to say it's horrible would be quite an understatement. Not to say things haven't changed at all, but it's still not where we should be in the year 2021. So let's go back to 2017 in Macon. A trans woman named Candace Towns was 30 years old, living her life as her true self. Saturday, the 28th of October, her best friend Malaysia Monroe would talk to Candace for the last time. Malaysia said that Candace had called her and they talked about getting drinks at a bar in town called the Crazy Bull. Candace really wanted Malaysia to come out and have a good time, 
But Malaysia didn't go, and now she really wishes she could go back and change that. Nobody heard from Candace after that Saturday night. She was reported as missing. Candace was said to be a giving, generous person who would offer the clothes off her back to anyone in need. She also had a larger-than-life personality. Back in 2009, Candace had a horrifying, violent experience that summer when she was shot in the ankle while walking. For transgender people, it was and still is dangerous for them to simply walk down the street. So, on the following Tuesday, October 31st, 2017, a little before 4 that afternoon, someone from a public work crew called 911. They told the operator there was a body on Rosecrest Avenue at the end of a driveway between two vacant homes. It was Candace. She was shot dead in the face, only about a block away from the place that she had been shot in the ankle nearly a few years before. She was found lying face up, and the shell casing of the bullet had landed between her legs. According to the Human Rights Campaign, Candace was officially the 25th transgender person to be killed in the United States in 2017, and the third in Georgia that year. Of the 25 transgender people killed as of that point in time in 2017, 21 of the 25 victims had been women of color, and 16 of them were black. 64% of the victims had their lives taken in the South. In July of 2020, Candace's family finally got a phone call that they weren't sure they'd ever get. Horace Jamal Marsh, a resident of Macon, had finally been arrested. Handgun ballistics that were an exact match to the 2018 Halloween shooting of Kibway Troop Steed that Horace Jamal Marsh carried out and was arrested for led to his arrest. Kibway was shot many times, but thankfully he was blessed to recuperate from the awful incident. The Bibb County Sheriff's Office questioned the 26-year-old young man after finding him where he worked at Freddy's Steak Burgers around 9 at night. After the questioning of Horace Jamal Marsh was over, he was charged with the fatal shooting of Candace on July 16, 2020. Before the family stepped in to correct the misinformation, the media misnamed Candace and her gender. When the media was reached out to about this incident from one of the sources I read, they didn't respond to the particular source. Candace's brother, Shamika Towns, said, quote, We've been praying a whole lot that eventually we would know who did it and why. It was amazingly shocking and so hurtful to actually know that. To see your family dead. He went on to say that the family just wants to know why. What happened? What could have gone so wrong for someone to go that far? But Candace's brother said the timing of the arrest could not have been better. Quote, Candace's birthday is in like five days. This is like the best birthday gift to Candace in the world. End quote. Candace's birthday is on July 22nd, and that year they were going to celebrate her life by releasing balloons, just like they had the last two years. Rhonda Everett, Candace's cousin, said, quote, You took away somebody I love. He was an uncle, brother, sister, whatever you want to call him. It doesn't matter if someone chooses to be someone other than what they were born we're all human, end quote. Horace Jamal Marsh was being held without bond in the summer of 2020 for the murder of Candace and attempted murder of Kimway. When there are any updates about this case and eventual trial, 
CJ and I will be sure to let you all know. Many of you might know covering an LGBTQ plus killer is not my favorite. Theirs is not the story I really want to tell. I generally have no sympathy, empathy, or even an understanding for them. The only exception is if I believe that they are wrongfully convicted. The killer in this case? <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrongful about this killer's conviction. In fact, I would love for this killer to stay a permanent member of the prison system. Why do I dislike this killer so much? Well, I think the biggest reason for my disdain for this person is that this person, this killer, not only took out their two parental units, but they also took out the family dog. I have no good feelies whatsoever for anyone who takes down their family pet. And there's your disclaimer, everyone, for an animal death in this story. With that, I wish I could turn away. Any story where an animal suffers or dies, it hurts me emotionally. I cried at Bambi and Dumbo, and those were just cartoons. So if you'll just stick with me, I promise I'm going to get us through this pet part as fast as possible. Winthrop, Maine, Halloween 2016. There was a chill in the air that evening as a multitude of homes got ready to pass out the traditional Halloween candies. A parade of children would be stopping by with their choruses of Trick or Treat! This evening's rituals were no different. As the evening hours fleeted into the dark of night, one residence would be done handing out candy to the last of the trick-or-treat stragglers. The household would turn off their outside lights, and then they would turn off their indoor lights as the family readied themselves for bed. The home's parents saw themselves off to their bedroom for sleep. Their son, 25-year-old Christopher, he stayed in the basement that had been converted into sort of an apartment for him. It was a great living space. There, Christopher could be near the comfort of his family while still having some independence of his own. Christopher was just chilling out in his room, not quite ready for bed yet. His parents were 47-year-old Tony Balser and 47-year-old Alice. Alice went by Allie. On all accounts, Tony and Allie were a wonderful couple. Tony was retired from the Coast Guard, and he enjoyed riding with a motorcycle group he belonged to. Allie worked at a veterinarian's clinic, and she had such a great love for animals. Also in the house that fateful night was Christopher's 17-year-old sister, Andrea. Andrea had been assigned male at birth, was given the name of Andrew, but now identified as Andrea and a trans woman. Andrea was tearful that night. She seemed to be battling some depression and she'd suffer with random episodes of tearful emotions. It's important to note, at this time, Andrea was not taking hormones, nor was she in the process of clinically transitioning. But Andrea seemed to be going through what I think, when it comes to transitioning, must be one of the hardest things to endure. And that's gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria has been described as the uncomfortable feeling of being in a skin that doesn't feel like it's yours. Gender dysphoria can manifest as distress, depression, anxiety, restlessness, or unhappiness. It might feel like anger or sadness, or feeling slighted or negative about your body, or like there's parts of your body that are missing or you have too many parts. An emotional Andrea went to wake her mom up. Andrea needed her mom. She needed to talk and be comforted by her. Allie woke up and came out to see what was wrong with Andrea. Allie put her hand gently on Andrea's shoulder, and then she soothingly rubbed her child's back as Andrea sobbed. Allie asked Andrea if she was having a rough night, and then she offered motherly words of love and encouragement. 
She leaned in to hug her daughter, and as she did this, she felt the piercing pain of a knife being plunged into her back, removed, and then plunged into her torso. This continued over and over again. Andrea stabbed her mother a total of nine times. During this, Allie had screamed, which woke her husband, Tony. It also alerted the family dog, a chihuahua. The chihuahua came running out and barking. Tony awoke, he shook the sleep from his head, and he got up. He came running out of the room to look for his wife. Andrea intercepted him in the kitchen and started to stab her dad. She stabbed Tony a dozen times. And then she turned her knife onto the family's pet chihuahua because the chihuahua wouldn't stop barking at the violence. Andrea's brother came up from his basement apartment to see what all the commotion was. With wide-eyed fear, Christopher could not believe what he was seeing. When Christopher froze staring at Andrea, she asked him if he wanted to die. She asked him this twice. Andrea told him it wasn't his day. Christopher then ran from the house. Andrea walked over to where her dead father lay. She slammed the hunting knife she used to kill her family into the flooring next to her dad. She then walked to the house phone and she dialed 911. Andrea spent 12 minutes on the phone with the dispatcher. At first, she sounded very pleased at her accomplishments and also very arrogant. When the dispatcher asks her name, she almost happily tells him, and then she spells her last name out for him. B-A-L-C-E-R, pretty much in that tone. The dispatcher then asks, Were you and your parents arguing? No, we weren't. Were they sleeping? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And my father woke up to her screams and I stabbed the fuck out of him. <laughs> Andrea seems to find this amusing. You stabbed your mother and father? Uh, yeah, he ain't breathing. <laughs> she ain't either. You're sure they're dead. Can we get help to them? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no helping them, <laughs> laughed Andrea. Andrea told the dispatcher she didn't know why she did it. She said she just snapped. She chuckled a lot on her emergency phone call. When the police arrived, she continued to laugh. Disheveled and sticky from her family's blood, Andrea sat handcuffed in the back of the patrol car. When the arresting officers got into the car with her, Andrea laughingly said to the officers, Since this is Halloween, there must be tons of 911 calls. I'll bet a lot of people think this is a prank or a joke because nothing happens in Maine. The officers weren't amused, and they didn't engage in conversation with Andrea, not until they got her into processing. During questioning, Andrea told the police she didn't know why she killed her parents. But later, that story would change. After having time to digest the situation she had just put herself into, Here's the new scenery that Andrea began to paint for her defense. She started to tell anyone who would listen that Tony and Allie were abusive parents. She said Tony would smack her in the back of her head and that her mom, Allie, would become sexually abusive with her. She also said both parents were emotionally abusive. Andrea told of when she was three or four years old and she said to her parents, when she grew up, she wanted to be a woman. Andrea said her parents were ashamed of her and they did not support her transitioning. They just kind of sat me down and told me and kind of physically forced into me that that was not something that was acceptable. I spent however many years being raised as a boy, as a man. It was drilled into me what men do, what they're supposed to be. I was never raised the way I wanted to be. So I'm conflicted between the person that I was raised to be and the person I want to be. I just want people to kind of realize that my family seemed almost perfect on the outside. A mother, father, two kids, a couple of animals. Nobody really thought there was anything going on. No one would think that two respectable people would ever do such a thing. 
I just want people to know that even when something seems perfect, there might be something much more worse going on underneath. And that's true, Andrea, there might be. But some people will also lie to save themselves, especially when victims can't use their words to tell their side of the story. I think it's pretty convenient how this seems to be the case for Andrea. She needed time to tell her story, or maybe to think up a story, and now her parents aren't here to tell their side. Andrea's uncle Carl, who was brother to her mother Allie, he said he had a long conversation with Andrea's dad, Tony. The conversation was about Andrea's transitioning. Carl said that Tony wasn't mad. He had no malice about it whatsoever. Tony was concerned, but what parent wouldn't be? He was concerned for Andrea's safety. Family and friends of the Balsers were outraged by Andrea's jailhouse accusations regarding her parents. They just couldn't believe these allegations were being made about two of the kindest people they had ever known. Even Tony and Allie's son Christopher basically said Andrea was off her rocker. The state of Maine's chief forensic psychologist who interviewed Andrea after the murder said Andrea had a lot of tension and a lot of confusion about her gender, and Andrea did not believe her parents to be supportive of her transitioning. I fucking want that job. I'll bet you the state forensic psychologist makes bank to come up with a cover analysis, diagnosis, that's easy peasy like that. What I want to know is why did Andrea really snap? I don't believe for one second it was gender dysphoria. The only one that would have driven Andrea to kill would be herself. So let's jump back a little bit to when Andrea accuses her mom of sexually abusing her. She said when she was 14, her dad was deployed for the military or he was with his motorcycle group or something like that. Andrea then said that her mom came home from work and started to hug and kiss her, and then the contact just progressed from there. This alleged sexual abuse went on for two years until Andrea was 16, and she told no one about it until now, and now she tells everybody about it. She said abuse by her dad was different. He'd smack her in the back of the head or on top of the head, Definitely somewhere where it wouldn't leave a mark. And on her 16th birthday, she said Tony took a gun to her chest, pulled the trigger, and said happy birthday, along with some type of expletive. Andrea didn't know the gun wasn't loaded. Being that Andrea was 17 when she killed her folks, and if the sexual abuse started three years prior... I don't understand why Andrea can't recall where her father was. Woo-wee! I don't know about you all, but I have to say, I am smelling some bullshit. I truly believe Andrea is making it up. And I also believe there's much more to her mental stability than her suffering from gender dysphoria. Andrea starts to tell about the night of the murders again. This time in her story... She hears a tone in her ears. A tone. A whistle. A screech. A long drawn out C chord. What the hell is meant by a tone? Andrea said that night she was sitting on her bed crying and shaking. She was holding a hunting knife her brother had given her as a gift. And that's when her mother came into the room to comfort her. Then Andrea says this tone is a high pitched tone and it's going through her head. She says this tone has been there once a week for the past two or three years. Then she goes on to say before her mother came into her room, about 1.30 a.m., she went into her parents' room, and she put her hand on her mother's hand. This woke her mom up. Her mother asked if she was having a rough night, and she told Andrea, come on, let's go sleep in your room. When they got to Andrea's room, her mother hugged her and she whispered in her ear, Do you want me to make everything better? And that's when Andrea said she came unhinged and she stabbed her mother. In Andrea's words, 
I must have been having a nightmare of all the things that had happened to me up until then. I still think this is a bunch of BS. First of all, why didn't that high-pitched tone drown out her mother's whisper? Second of all, if your mom's abusive, why are you in there waking her ass up to come comfort you? Third of all, if you're in your room waiting for your mom, why are you putting a knife in your hand if you're not planning to kill her? And just when she whispers those wrong words in your ear, that's when you snap. But how convenient you have the knife in your hand. I hate to victim shame, but I'm not so sure Andrea is the victim in this case. At Andrea's trial, a judge and a jury of her peers, they'd agree with me. Andrea was tried as an adult because of how brutal and unsuspecting the crime was. She was offered a plea deal, and that deal would take the death sentence off the table. So Andrea pleaded guilty as long as there was a cap on her sentence of 55 years. Her defense attorney urged the judge to make her sentence closer to the minimum of 25 years. The week of her sentencing, Andrea turned 20 years old. Her brother Christopher made an impact statement asking the judge, no, actually it was more like telling the judge really, this is what he said. In my view, all leniency does is put a remorseless murderer back on the street. I still hear our dearest mother's screams every night as I fall asleep, every morning as I awaken. They echo in my head, her screams as she was stabbed by the son she doted on so much, the son she only wanted the world for and would accept nothing less. You are an inhuman creature, and the fact that you continue to pretend otherwise sickens me. Andrea was sentenced to 40 years of incarceration. The judge took into account her clean criminal record, her good grades, her age, and that she accepted responsibility for the murders, which she didn't really. She blamed her parents for the reason they were murdered. What the judge would not take into consideration was Andrea's struggles with gender dysphoria. The judge said other transgender people struggle with family acceptance, other transgender people struggle with society's acceptance. They have struggles the same as you, and they don't kill anyone. That judge is 100% spot on. Also taking into account that Andrea was 17 years old, she said her sexual abuse by her mom ended when she was 16. I don't believe it ever happened, but if it did, she was 17 years old now. She could have emancipated herself from her family probably sooner, and at the very least, the age of 18 was right around the corner. She could have legally been considered an adult at that age. She could have told her family, peace out. Truly, there is something much deeper in this woman's mental health that needs to be addressed. I hope eventually she will get the help she needs. I only wish that she could have found it before taking the lives of Tony, Allie, and their chihuahua. Paige and I hope that you've enjoyed our series, and we hope that you'll subscribe to both our shows if you haven't already. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. <laughs> <laughs>